I'm allowed to be out of here by half past, so we haven't got a huge amount of time. Um, the PowerPoint we put together here will make available to you by Mr. Bullock, so we'll pass it on to him at the end of the session and he can distribute that. There are a couple of links in there you might want to click on uh, to click on and explore a bit further. So the, the reason that Mr. Bullock approached the geography department to ask him to help a little bit was to try and give you the, the geographical perspective behind the large data set you're looking at. We're not going to look at any of the data at all in this uh, session. We're just going to try and give you some of the geography uh, behind some of the patterns that you might expect to see uh, changing between 2001 and 2011 and changing through space as well. Um, so we, we're focusing on demographic profiles which you might be able to expect to see uh, and then uh, the method of travel to work and how that might change as well through space. And uh, as we go, we'll try and highlight some of the temporal uh, aspects as, as, as well. Um, so, we won't linger on this, but um, just to give you some background on the broad definitions of, of what constitutes urban and what constitutes rural, um, it's quite hard to define in the UK, uh, and I'll explore that in a little bit more detail in a minute. Um, the term urban varies through space, like in Norway, 200 people is defined as urban, that's not the same in the UK. Um, the census breaks it down into these three terms here. So it's a conurbation, which is a number of cities grouped together, uh, like the Greater Manchester area, for example, that is urban. If it's a city, and designated as city status, then it's urban. If it's a town, it's urban. Um, within that, you've got this idea of what uh, a metropolitan area is. A metropolitan area is just a densely populated urban core, but the suburbs that then surround that. So for example, the London metropolitan area are the London boroughs, uh, which includes some well, if you've ever been as far south as Croydon and head further south than that, you're a long way out of central London, that's still designated as Greater London. Uh, but towns like Watford and St Albans aren't within the Greater Metropolitan area. Um, what constitutes rural? Rural is slightly more difficult, I suppose. Uh, we can break it down into two different uh, aspects. Accessible rural, um, so towns which are sat within rural areas and then the urban fringe. And we have remote rural, so places that aren't very accessible. Um, I'll leave this on the slide and you guys can look at it if you want, but this is how the census breaks it down. Uh, and they work it out based on density and sparsity of population in these different areas. Uh, now just to try and blur the lines, and the reason that it's pretty futile um, to think in a lot of depth about what constitutes urban, what constitutes rural, is because in the UK uh, the lines are blurred by this model, so something called the urban-rural continuum. The idea that as you move out of large cities, then you get change in the size of settlements um, until you reach essentially kind of sparsely populated remote rural areas. Uh, and this could be London, this could be Manchester, it could be Leeds, wherever, uh, and you kind of emanate out. Settlements get smaller, um, they become more rural, and there is a change with services and a change with demographics as we move out there too. Um, this is the rural urban fringe, so where the city stops and rural areas start is really hard to pin down. Lots of the UK looks like this, <coughs> so hard to define whether that's urban or rural. If you look at a map which shows uh, rural urban definitions, this is 2011, the black areas are conurbations, uh, and you can see emanating out from there, we've got our urban cities and towns uh, moving out into sort of sparser areas in the fringes of England. Um, here. But essentially, the further out you move from conurbations, the less dense it becomes and the more rural it becomes. Um, just to put that into perspective, though, this is quite an interesting statistic. So, the UK has 80, well, we define our population as being 82.4% urban. So, a huge majority of the UK is classified as urban dwellers. Um, yet, only 9.3 million rural dwellers, and very, very few people live in sparse rural areas. Um, What's also interesting is that when you compare that to our statistics about UK land use, so fewer than 6% of the UK is classified as urban in terms of land use. What that means is we've got really high densities of populations living in our conurbations, our cities, so the grey and black areas. Um, and just to illustrate that, within relatively in our local areas, so this is Greater London here, if we take a, uh, a transect moving out in the northwest from there, you can see what a patchwork of the, the landscape in kind of central England looks like. It's just a series of kind of nucleated small settlements uh, with rural space dotted around it. But these will have high density, be they small green dots or the larger conurbation areas. 
um, so the UK has just done a bit of patchwork of this, which makes interpreting your data quite difficult. We'll come back to this in a second because um, Mr. First talks us about transport, this becomes really important. The car dependency and, and the relationship between settlements is important there. So, we're just going to look at how demographic profiles vary through that patchwork. So what, what do our population profiles look like as you move out of conurbations and out into these more accessible rural areas and then beyond? Um, a couple of key graphs which explain the key trends that you need to take on board. I suppose the, the thing to look at is the number of people over the age of 45, so your grey uh, lines up into red. We can see a clear trend that the further out you get away from conurbations, major conurbations, the older village <coughs> profiles get. Um, that's a distinct pattern we see all across the UK. Similarly, um, urban and rural areas, you can see a, a quite a clear trend of younger than 45 and above 45, uh, and the England whole as well. Now, the takeaways from that, I won't spend too long lingering on statistics, but trying to explain some of it is quite important. So why is it that rural areas are disproportionately older than urban areas? Well, there are two major things that facilitate that. If you're a geographer, this will be uh, relatively straightforward stuff to you, but we see a lot of the youth leaving rural areas because of lack of opportunities, so we have this brain drain of younger people. A lot of our isolated rural areas don't have universities. Cornwall doesn't have a university. Cumbria doesn't have a red front university. People move out of these areas to go to university to seek opportunities. And at the same time, we have the movement in of retirees. Cornwall has a huge retiree uh, population moving into it every uh, year. Lake District slightly fewer, but people do move to these rural areas. So we see this ageing population um, accentuated by that. And at the same time, we've got our urban hubs pulling in migrants domestically, which we just mentioned, but also we've got our international migrants. Very few international migrants move to rural areas unless they are farm workers, making, packing um, goods, and that is a, a transient trend. The vast majority of people move to urban areas, so our urban areas are youthful. And because they're youthful, we also have a growing um, birth rate because the population is youthful itself. So the pull of economic and education hubs is really important in explaining these trends. Now, a thing to remember, though, is that beyond that, pretty much the whole UK is ageing. So we have a, a distinct ageing population, which is only going to get worse over the next uh, 20, 30 years, which is quite interesting. So just to visualise that. Um, so this is the UK, just click on the right tab. UK 65 years and over uh, in 1997. Um, so we can see there are really distinct geographic trends as to who is old and where they live. Uh, seeking the sea air on the coast uh, to try and um, improve their lung conditions and wave their Brexit flags. Um, now if we look over time, so if I click play 1997, this is going well beyond your large data set, 2037. And we see these trends are just accentuated. So our rural areas are ageing much quicker than our urban areas. By 2037, uh, we would expect a trend which uh, yeah, just accentuates the show we still in 1997. So our, our urban hubs remain young, although they're still aging themselves in the rural areas, and just getting distinctly older. So. <coughs> just to muddy the water slightly. Um, so they're the macro trends, so urban and rural trends. Now within urban areas, we see micro trends as well. So, there are differing age profiles in differing bits of cities. If we take London, for example, depending on what age you are, what your needs are, you might want to live in different parts of the city, uh, which is quite interesting. Mr. Firth likes this graph, so he uh, will talk you through it. Um, so another, one, another reason for the driver for the movement of people moving from the centres out to the outskirts is um, through property price because um, they can't afford to live in these central areas. Um, and this is shown quite clearly by if you take the transect using one of the tube lines. So this is a central line going from one end to the other, so going from this route all the way through, and it goes straight through the CBD, through the central business district. And you can see that house property prices rocket up as you get closer and closer to the centre. Um, and that's just like a key trend that the, the kind of in the centre of your cities, it's unaffordable for the youthful population, and so therefore they move out to the outskirts not to the rural areas, but to the outskirts, and so then they're able then to kind of still commute in, but they're not able to live in the centres. So again, that's kind of a trend which is kind of ever going greater and greater, so you're likely to see your data 
movement towards younger people living on the outskirts um, in these areas. Um, and you can kind of play with the rest of them, and look at the Met Line of the Northern Line, and see how these property prices change. Um, I think that's how you go along. So, um, when you, if you stay in London, you go to university in London, you're likely going to live in central London, and then when you leave university, you might stay in central areas as you rent, etc. The moment you want to buy a house, unless you're super rich, there's no way you're going to stay in central areas. The moment you want a family, you want a garden, you want a garage um, for your lawnmower or whatever, you start to move out, and people suburbanise. And our map of London looks like that. This is a suburban map of London. So these outskirts here show our mean age, plus 41 is for dark blue. So all the, not all the, I suppose all the age profiles we're not talking about are, are very old, but are people who are having young families and moving to the outskirts. Now what's interesting is the property prices that Mr Firth mentioned uh, then distort this even further. So our international migrants are also moving to the outskirts. So our fastest diversifying London boroughs are the outskirts too. So the most action in terms of demographic change is occurring in the outskirts of London. So we've got our older age profiles in gardens, etc. And we've got our international migrants moving in who can't afford the rent prices in central London. So rewind 30, 20, 30 years and your migrant hubs in London were central. They were Brixton, they were Brick Lane, uh, Whitechapel, etc. People are being driven out of those areas. They are no longer low income areas as they become gentrified. So our low income areas get pushed to the outs outskirts. So we've got hugely diverse areas in the, in the outer boroughs, which is really interesting. And that happens in every city. This is a trend of reurbanisation. So Manchester, Leeds, the low income areas are no longer those central inner city areas. They're starting to be pushed into the outskirts, which is quite interesting. So just a couple of takeaways, then, to the transport and finish. So, um, UK's ageing, rural areas are feeling that strongest and will continue to do so. Collaborations do remain youthful, but we have distinct demographic patterns within those. Um, as external forces kind of force people to the edges. Cool. Um, so the other set of your data, so you've got demographic, the other side of it is looking at the, um, looking at the transport and how the transport goes on. So, methods of transport has um, clear patterns, and we'll give you an overview and then how we think it's going to change up what your data should show you um, as you go through. Um, so just to put this kind of into the context, like the national context, um, just generally kind of what your data should see. You should see a much higher uh, proportion of people drive. Driving is a dominant um, and a mode of transport, um, and we should just see that across across the board. Um, next kind of to, to kind of movement of people is then kind of walking, but there's kind of like small scale, like you're not kind of traveling, you live nearby to your um, local, local area. But across the whole nation, um, we're looking at kind of car transport to dominate the commuting um, pattern. So if you're comparing against rural rural areas versus urban areas, these are the patterns that we think you should be able to see and try and explain why. So in um, people living in rural areas will make much more trips um, than uh, those people in urban areas and that they will be travelling much further. The key driver for that is the fact that whether you have those services there available for you. So do you have the access to you know, shops, those type of things? You guys are very used to being able to just walk across to a supermarket, you won't be within a mile of it. Most other areas, um, you have to travel quite far to go that distance. And so those are the, that's kind of the main driver for it. Um, and those services are thinning out in the rural areas. So we expect to see your trends from 2001 to 2011 so that more people are going to be trans, uh, traveling by car um, in those rural areas. Um, that's then it's kind of repeated again in terms of um, they travel twice as far within it. Um, then in urban conurbations, I saw your data that you were looking at um, you had access to different infrastructure, so you're looking at buses, trains, that type of thing. Those services are more really <coughs> prevalent in the cities. And so again, as more and more investment gets put into the cities, We'd, sit, we'd expect to see that usage rising. So again, that, that's another, another trend that we'd expect you to be um, spotting through it. Um, so yes, that's just kind of that's just kind of supporting that. So here we've got urban conurbations are up in this, this kind of area, moving all the way through to the rural areas. So we've got a clear pattern that the car usage in cities is much much lower than in the uh, in the rural areas, um, and congestion is one reason. Um, and we'll look at that in a second. Um, in terms with regards to that. Got some other supporting stats which you can have a look at in your own time. Um, car ownership kind of mirrors this, so there you've got much lower car ownership, so car ownership again will be limited um, within that. Um, mainly it's just the fact that you can't park uh, cars in that area, and also you're not going to be as reliant on those cars um, across that um, time. 
This is one which we'd like to spend a little bit more time uh, talking through. So cars are in the uh, this kind of colour, and then we're kind of moving down. This is tubes, trains, buses for those who can't see the back. Um, and there's a clear pattern. So if you're looking at areas which are perhaps on a rural, um, urban fringe or kind of central, so on the urban fringe, kind of suburb areas, the cars dominate um, that movement of. Uh, mainly due to limited transport provision. So in these areas, unless you're on like one of these major train lines or tube lines, you need to be able to drive everywhere if you're on, if you're on those uh, that kind of suburb, suburb regions. It's also mainly because your employer might be in the suburb, suburb region, so then you can move out to those um, through just using your car. <coughs> You'd likely to see a much more increased reliance on public transport to get close to the centre. So that's going to increase as we get more investment. So we're talking about kind of cross rail, cross rail this kind of um, investment being put in there. Um, also, as we're going through like greater kind of environmental awareness with the lack of pollution or trying to reduce our pollution, they're going to try to, well, the governments are trying to constrict the amount that we can have in terms of uh, people driving in the central region. So, if you're looking at micro kind of patterns between central uh, central cities and then kind of moving out to suburbs, that's another thing which we'd expect to see um, is that this kind of pattern just gets more and more um, extreme as, you go, as we go along. Um, final thing is probably this just, this just shows you and highlights the fact that investment is limited, or is, is going less and less in terms of uh, investing in the rural areas. So this top line is, these are, these are buses and you could probably say for most things in terms of um, tra probably <coughs> transport investments um, in terms of outside of London. London is, is kind of bucks the trend, it gets a lot of money getting put in it. Um, in terms of investment, um, so we look at uh, our bus usage over the course of um, this kind of period, you see it rising mainly because the investment's going in there. Um, other areas that that kind of provision is dropping off, and so you'd likely to have that being replaced by people being able, just having to resort to driving. And so, again, in your data, I would expect you to see between 2001, 2011, and then perhaps future, um, you'd have much more reliance on cars um, as you go along. Um, through the lack of investment in those rural areas, um, and all this kind of goes back to that original map that we showed of the kind of the area, but like the rural area, and um, kind of not have, kind of having all that spread in that that area. Um, in it. So, oh, yeah, just to try and highlight those links between the demographic change and the uh, methods to work, methods of travel to work change. So. Asian profiles in rural areas, impacts from rural services, plus services in rural areas are only going to continue to drop, uh, which means that there's going to be increased car dependency in rural areas, and you should be able to see that in your data. Um, similarly, car dependency in urban areas will decrease for all that number of reasons that Mr. Firth um, highlighted. But just to bring that map back up, I think the one final message to leave you with is that it's very easy to be sat here in your North London uh, bubble and kind of misrepresent what the rest of the UK is like. The vast majority of people in the UK are car dependent, their families are car dependent. They go to the supermarket in the car, they go to football training in the car, they do whatever. You use the car for everything. Um, and it's only cities in which you see that, that trend decreasing. You should be able to see that in your um, data. Right, we'll leave it there. Um,